Yeah, you meet up at the suicide bomb at hell. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Punisher War Journal, Volume 3. We're going to be covering uh, Episodes 7, 8, and 9. This is a big one. This is where uh, a lot of rubber meets road, and a lot of our plot threads start to getting, getting tied in, and a few maybe get unraveled. My name's Mose. I'm joined by my illustrious colleagues, Devin Higgins. All right. Who raided the fridge again? Right. Jason Johnson. Six Semper Tyrannus. Eric Scott. I look forward to the uh, future spinoff episode called Frank Castle, Child Psychologist. Mmm, interesting. And Sean Shibley. If you're going to treat people monstrously, you're going to eventually have to deal with monsters. I love the fact that incomparable listeners all have now got it that there needs to be some sort of quip uh, after they are introduced, and it pleases me to virtually no end. So, getting started, last when last we met, Lewis uh, had stabbed O'Connor, and we are brought straight into the aftermath of that, um, where we have... And this seems to be a mon a, a shot that seems to be like similar in a lot of movies now, and I, I'm seeing it more and more, which is kind of bizarre. I'm not to say I don't like it, but now it's starting to become slightly rote. But um, guy in the in the over the sink, uh, washing blood off of him. We saw it in Logan. Uh, I think Frank does it. Maybe not yet. Um, and now we have Lewis uh, kind of trying to wa- wash the blood off. Pretty and, ineffectually. Yeah, yeah, started in Terminator. Uh, there you go. Bringing it around to something we talked about off air. <laughs> and but so and, and this brings in him coming oh, a, uses a shower curtain to wrap up O'Connor, which is, you know, like the the, the minimal stuff you can do. Uh, and bringing us into the into the tr- into the into the first credits in the opening credits, um, he s- sees his father and decides that he's going to blow his head off. Um, gets in, into his room, which is you know kind of a very shocking, very heavy moment before before opening uh, credits, but it kind of gave. A little bit of allusion to what this character is now. He's now hit rock bottom. Uh, and I think we're going to start to see how that lays out in the next few episodes. Uh, but anyway, first thoughts. Well, um, to take that back to the, the Terminator reference just a minute ago, I, I noted that that kind of was a machine mode. You know, he was just, um, you know, disconnected and pulling the chair curtain. The look on his face was just blank. He just was, you know, kind so- of. Disconnected. So something that really struck me, and I, I kind of have to jump ahead combining it, because there's a motif Do it. of Marine being bestial with a knife mm-hmm. that we see three times. Okay. Uh, we see it in uh, with Lewis. We see it with Frank in his child psychology session. And we see it with uh, Russo in the firefight. Oh, yes. So we see yeah. all three of our main, like, Marine <clears throat> fighters that we see, we see them all go kind of beast mode with a knife, kind of how the like most basic of weapons and the most basic of violence. Yeah, and it was kind of interesting that I guess after he you know had tr- tried to clean himself up, he had you know, I guess taken his shirt off because it had blood on it, and plus it had you know the cut from the knife wound. That he just leaves his shirt off and he just gets in his cab, goes home with his shirt off. It's like yeah, that's not conspicuous, you know, inconspicuous yeah. at all. Which is fine because it, it's, it just kind of proves that he's just become so. Yeah, disassociated with reality at this point because he's just in shock or he's just he's just basically snapped and gone at this point that he's just like just doing whatever. You know? And, and how is his father not seeing that wound? I and but I think that also kind of leads like when he has a conversation with his father, 
uh, during the Muhammad Ali fight uh, when they're sitting together. And he and he kind of just says, I, I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I, you know, I'm trying to show you something to maybe say that you, you, you're, you're not as broken as you think you are. You can still, I guess, quote, be a winner. Um, and that kind of doesn't fall quite right with Lewis at all. You know, he's like, do you think that I'm, I'm not who, who I should be? And but I feel so horrible for his father because he doesn't know how to help his son. Yeah, I mean, knows, it's it's really broken. He knows yeah. what worked for him, and he tries to give him the pills because that was part of what helped him get through his yeah. his loss. But that's as far as he knows how to go. He doesn't know what else to do. And it's kind yeah. of a macrocosm. Like, I mean, one of the things, the more I think about it, the more I I think doesn't work, is the whole concept of the Punisher comes really from the cynicism of the Vietnam War. And moving mm-hmm. it to the Iraq War, and to Afghanistan, that's why they kind of had to add the shady element to the dealings, because in the original story, he was just a soldier, no like no shady dealings, just a little bit of incompetence in the higher-ups. Um, so I think it's kind of a, a metaphor and kind of a, well, a microcosm for society didn't know how to handle these broken troops, right? They didn't know what to do, and their first instinct was to medicate, and they really just didn't have the language or the or the framework to even understand. Like, they knew something was wrong, and they knew they should intervene, but for all they're trying, they just didn't know how. Yeah, and it was interesting to see how, in that scene in the kitchen, when he comes home and finds his dad there, it's that you you know he's still in that mode, but I think it's when he comes in and finally sees him standing there, and you, he immediately puts his hands behind his back so his dad won't see the blood on him. But his dad, I mean, it's a terrible place for a parent to find themselves in where, yeah, you he's obviously concerned. He wants to try and help him. And the, the quote that stood out to me in that conversation was when he looks up and says, look, there's no shame in having bad dreams. And you know that in the back of Lewis's mind, his fractured, twisted mind at this point, that it's gone way beyond that, which is what makes the next point when he makes it down to the basement, he just loses it. I mean. The fact that it all finally just goes up to the surface, he breaks down. When you're in a high pressure, high ten, uh, high tension situation like that, finally you're at a point where you can take your foot off the gas, and that fight or flight syndrome, whether you wanted to or not, just finally leaves you. The fact that he was just sitting there gasping, completely upside down makes that point where he goes for the gun that he has tucked in the back of his pants and thinks, well, I just killed a guy. I lied to my dad. My dad doesn't know what to do to help me out. The person that I have looked towards my whole life, the person that had the answers when I've wanted them or the support when I've needed it, whatever. He doesn't know what to do. So what the hell do I do? And when he doesn't do it, it's like, okay, now you're looking at him going, what what is next? What could he possibly do next? But it was interesting how we open with this shot of of Lewis and O'Connor's house, and we get this same sort of of montage that we do at the end of episode eight, with Donnie, and how those two kind of bounce off each other as well, but in slightly different ways. Mm. Yeah, there in the in this section of three. Uh, there is, it's not exactly foreshadowing, but there are, they've left these little breadcrumbs. Um, for example, um, I was just thinking about this in episode eight, Cold Steel. Uh, I believe we open up on Billy grooming himself for the day. Yep. And you, we see how, and, and he's been called pretty by Stein. And so... We know that Billy is wait, he's a good looking guy and he he prides himself on that. And that's very interesting to me knowing that he will become Jigsaw and w- th- what the tipping point probably is for him to become uh that character. And it, it, you know again we're not going to see that for some time now in for, as as far as I know. Um, but that I found there, there were these little trace hints on, and, and people mirroring other things that had happened. 
Uh, that's yeah. That, well, th- it's, it's a very cool three segment. If that would be the internal, and I know we'll discuss it if it comes up, but that'd be the internal becoming outside, right? I mean, <clears throat> he's already messed up on the inside. Just look at some of the stuff he's he's done, and and yeah, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to the the where his grooming was leading, which was to visit to his mom. I mean, that's that's it's, it's, he's not a stable individual. It's just he's got a pretty exterior to go to, to mask it. Yeah. Well, let, let's hey, let's let's check in with Mike Rowe and Frank. Uh, coming off the intro, uh, they're having a little powwow over pasta and deciding what they're going to do with Colonel Bennett. So I want to say the thing that struck me is this is the first time we see Frank eating not disgusting food. Mm, like mm-hmm, the first mm-hmm. time, like it seems like he's starting to feel a little bit like like he's allowing himself a little bit of luxury for the first time. Yeah, because we do know that his wife made um, different d- different meals during like Thanksgiving, like the the meatballs, and you could tell like he was th- there was that that food fantasy kind of thing where it's like this is the kind of things I miss. And it comes up later when he makes the rice. I mean, he's definitely getting you know culinary on everybody. And it, I just think the contrast earlier on. You know, he would eat the beans right out of the can and. Uh like the rations and stuff, you wouldn't eat like real food. Yeah. I, I I think that is a really good telltale point. Like there is this, that they seem to be becoming friends or at least that trust is, is, is kind of being, um, not personified, but there, there are now elements that say, okay, we can, we can, we don't have to live in this depravity and and fight a fight well in this part we also have the discussion about agent orange and what they're going to try and do to figure out who he is next where you have what i i called the bennett job it's okay we know an avenue to get to agent orange to find out who he is so frank can obviously go kill him um and they're discussing the the logistics on how they're going to do that and then, mm-hmm. but this is a really short scene. That's that's one of the things I like about episode seven is is that you've got to pay attention because this one jumps back and forth so fast. We get the extended opening with Lewis, but then it goes from Frank to Madani, back to Frank, back to to different areas. So you have to kind of get an idea as these uh, strategies are are all playing out in in semi real time between the two sides to go. Okay, how are we going to get what we need done done? Hmm. Um, one big thing I thought that came out of that conversation, I believe it's at this point, um, where Frank has to make a decision about soldiers that are going to be in his way and what he's going to do with them. And I think there are a couple, there are a couple points in these episodes where this happens, where it is a true foreshadowing of what do I need to do? Do, are they collateral damage? Or do I, you know, do this operation in such a way that it's surgical, where I don't have to meet up with them? But inevitably, he does. Yeah, and Micro br- Micro brings it up where he says, "I I can't do what you do, and I appreciate what you're doing." But then it becomes a question of how far off the diving board Frank wants to jump, and can he? Once he goes into Punisher mode, can he show restraint? And Frank, to his credit, says, "Look." The soldiers that are there protecting Bennett, they're doing their job. I don't want to have to kill them. There's no reason why I should. They're not the goal. They uh, Bennett is the goal. Agent Orange is the goal. These guys are just here. And, and him being a soldier himself, obviously he respects the fact that they're in a similar position that he was in when he was in Afghanistan and other points during his military career of... You've been given orders. You've got to carry them out. You don't get to sit there and say, nah, I don't feel like it today because Ben is just a putz. You have to stay in guard. You have to walk point. You have to be there to, to get this done. Frank recognizes that. More importantly, he respects it. And the fact that now that we're sitting there trying to figure out, is he going to go completely Rambo on these guys or not? We don't know yet. And I don't think he knew until he got right in that situation and had to make the decision on the spot. I think it was, he was still a question in his mind going to that point. How far can I go? How far can he actually process that level? So. Well, Madani starts to figure out 
wait a minute, how is it that Gunner died so fast? How is it that all these things seem to have transpired in such a in, in such a fast fast movement? And she kind of figures out with Stein that there seems to be a little bug in the house. And this is also foreshadowed by our boy Billy, who says, no one's listening. Yeah, and I think I think that's how she figured it out. I think that was the the unintentional slip that kind of put the put the the bug in her ear to use the the phrase that you know there had to be somebody listening to figure out this stuff. I, I kind of think he slipped his hand there. Yeah, and it's interesting also how you still get the the back and forth between the two of them where they're lying to one another so easily when when Billy walks in and, and obviously he's trying to uh, give her a little PDA and. She's like, no, we're on the clock here. None of, none of that in my office. But then Billy lies to her about meeting Frank. You know, he sort his sources say he's dead. Of course, but Donnie doesn't believe him because she she's seen him in with her own eyes. Uh, and then when Sam comes in and chastises Madani for Billy's involvement in finding Frank, he's not cool with it. But Madani, her point was that you know trust involves instinct, but. It's when when Billy says to her, yeah, you know, relax, nobody's listening. In, in hindsight, watching this a second time, I was like, wow, you might as well just put up a big billboard saying your office may be bugged. You see, mm-hmm. and I didn't think that was unintentional. You think that Billy slipped it f- as a, for a reason? Yeah, I think, I mean, first of all, I don't think, I find an interesting question. At what moment does Billy betray Frank in his heart? Not like in action, but you know what I mean? Like, when does he decide that he will actively work against Frank? Okay. Right? And I don't think he's, I mean, he's definitely not there right now, right? Oh, no, I think, it was, it, I think well, it was back in the last episode or the previous episode when he was ready to hand him over to Rollins. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, th- th- kind of think at, so, at, too. At the meeting, they would have, you know, if Frank would have showed up to the meeting, you know, Rollins would have, you know, or Billy would have turned him over to Rollins and Rollins would have killed him. I still think he's not all the way there yet. Like, I mean, doesn't, I mean, I, I agree. That's a pretty strong point, but I still think he would, at this point, he would still prefer that Frank survive. Well, and he's protecting Frank by saying that none of my sources, my close, my small community say that Frank is dead. And so he's covering for Frank, but is he covering for Frank or is he covering for himself? Well, I think he's I covering think, for Billy. I think, Part of it is he's telling Madani that, you know, he's, he's telling Madani that your office is bugged and I know your office is bugged, right? Um, he's also saying, he's also kind of communicating, I'm your friend, I'm giving you this information even though we both know I shouldn't. I think he's setting up a contingency uh, where Madani's going to start to not trust his associates. Uh, Russo's associates, so that he could probably spin that later into uh, playing those two sides against each other if he has to. He's he's so confident himself that it's just an arrogance thing. I don't I don't I don't know that I'm quite to the point where I think he was in in trying to tip her off intentionally. Well, and yeah, to that, it, he, he's got everybody snowed that you know no one believes Billy's in on anything. You know, Madani mm-hmm. says you know she trusts Sam because it's instinct. She trusts Billy. Well, no, I mean we 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 know, but he's not trustworthy. But she believes him. You know, she's telling things that you know she wouldn't tell him if she didn't fully trust him. So you know, her instinct's a little off on that respect. And even Frank doesn't believe Billy's in on it either. So it, Billy's pretty good at keeping people you know thinking he's on the up and up. Well, and later on in this block, you also get the conversation with Russo and Rollins down at the docks where they're waxing poetic about how New York has changed. And But you also get the understanding that Russo doesn't like Rollins all that much because right. Rollins has him at the end of a leash. It's like, well, you owe me. So you're going to do what I do, what I tell you to do. You're going to dance when I tell you to dance. And Russo doesn't like that. So it becomes that cliche of my enemy of my enemy is my friend russo being the opportunist understands that if he can play madani well enough that if he can find value in getting out that way he wins or if he goes through rollins way and takes frank out he wins that way so he's using a multi-pronged approach to be able to get to his goal which is 
to not be discovered and to get away with what he's done with the minimalist consequences possible. Um, I also want to add, I think that Frank, or not Frank, but Billy, this contempt that he has for both of them, and and again, this whole enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know, after the situation occurs when Frank um, gets in with the colonel, and that three-way conversation between Rollins, Bennett, and Billy, you know, Bennett tries to pull rank out right out and say, you know, look, listen, I'm the ranking guy here, and rank follows. And Billy's like, you know, yeah, you can you can tell the disdain from guys that have been in the shit and have had to do dirty deeds. And the you know, it's like, you know, you've never done any of this kind of stuff. I do it. And it, it, there there's a there's a a real um power struggle between you know those that are of higher rank making poor decisions and those that actually are doing the action which brings me back to my original conceit that moving this to a war that wasn't vietnam kind of robs a lot of the undertones because you know if if you study vietnam war history that was a huge problem like you know uh like uh less than experienced less than competent you know uh low high ranking officers was a big problem mm-hmm. in the Vietnam War. Um so it's one of those things that a lot of the themes in Punisher stories, I I just really think I mean I know why they had to, because, you know, you can't have Frank be pushing sixty, seventy at this point. But Right. But it just a lot of the I think a lot of the underlying themes don't translate as well. I, I think you're right. I in 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 so far as I, I could I remember that Especially, you know, watching some of the Vietnam stuff um, and documentaries, this, this, you know, you had so many, for lack of a better term, so many people going through the meat grinder that you were getting less than um, substantial uh, leadership. And so you would be following your staff sergeants, your gunnies, because these are the guys that had already seen things and were able to adapt to situations. So when orders came down you know it was often uh these riflemen that were they were listening to 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 just above them not all you know their lts and higher yeah because in the draft era basically if you had a college degree you were a lieutenant right? right and so there was a very common problem of lieutenant versus sergeant in um in in that war Interesting. For exactly those reasons, the sergeants, you know, made rank made their rank through being, you know, surviving long enough to do it in that war, and the lieutenants are usually, you know, often just refresh off the off the plane. Yeah. Uh, our colonel, Colonel Bennett, uh, Frank does his. I, I didn't know going into this what exactly Frank was going to do. We, you know, because we. Knew he wasn't supposed to die, and that's what kind of Micro was saying. Like, you know, this guy has information. You can't just waste him. And I wasn't expecting a phone clone to be happening while he was in there, which, again, we were kind of off air talking about uh, editing of time. That was a kind of just pins and needles of waiting for this phone to be cloned because, I mean, I think we've all been there when we we're updating our phones, uh, how long that takes at times and you think it will be an easy quick thing to do and in the middle of this you've got to be uh taking down uh a room full of individuals i was watching with my son last night and the shot where frank pops smoke and kind of does this you know jesus christ pose and drops the smoke it was it was kind of riveting it was one you know you you look for you know sometimes these awesome little shots in here and that that you know got me uh slightly more interested in in, in that uh he didn't even have he didn't even seem to have a gun on him no i gotta yeah, say this saying. is one of my favorite sequences in the whole series was this about five six minute chunk because you have frank in a confined space with the colonel he understands what's up and he knows there are guys coming to get him and what does he do he he 
does the tactical understanding of he's in a small space, so he's got to make the best of it right now. And then when you have them trying to track him down with the lasers going through that smoke was even better because now you're sitting there trying to figure out, okay, how are they going to find him? How is he going to avoid them? And just how that whole thing was staged, I thought was just really, really well done. Yeah, I, I, I like the I like the one scene where like the the one guy you can see his laser and all of a sudden you see it like jerking around because Frank's yes. like, taking him out silently. That that was pretty funny. Yeah, I like I like the whole conceit of the whole thing. Um, I, I will mention just I think that's part of what what the the teamwork of Micro and Frank that 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 gives him the ability to do because you know it gives him the technology aspects to let Frank do his thing, but yet it's all you know really Micro's scheme to, to clone the phone right i mean that's not a frank thing that's a micro thing but right. and, you know, it gets him in there to do it and i will say between this sequence and the sequence we had last time with uh gunner and the leaves um just from the mechanical like cinematography you know standpoint um i think this series finally takes a crown from daredevil season one. Ooh, strong talk explain just I mean, everybody talks about that season, Daredevil season one, the hallway fight. Sure. And, and it, yes. it's amazing. It is amazing. Right. But these two sequences, I think, I mean, in a different way, but they are still just so well put together. Just, you know, just from a pacing, from a color contrast, from a everything standpoint that I just, I think it's a bigger feat of technical filmmaking than the, the, well, the albeit impressive uh, hallway scene. And, and regardless uh, of which one you place as the highest of those two, it's definitely the best we've seen in my opinion since then. I mean, I don't think anything yes, in, in the other series indeed. comes close. Yeah, every other no. series tried to make like that <clears throat> scene again. Even this show does it once. But I would argue for the stairwell scene in season two of Daredevil with when they have Frank in the elevator. I really liked that because it looks like they they took that and improved on what they got in season one. That's not to discount what ha- that that hallway shot in season one at all i'm I'm like one and one a on those but yeah with what they were able to do with the kineticness in this scene of and also with what what you didn't see yeah totally and 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 again there was no there was no blood porn in this it was frank quietly taking guys out you use the laser lights as your guide on it and when billy thinks he's got frank when he looks back and he sees that one laser pointing to in his direction and he shoots and it's just a gun sitting there. I was like, tactically that was brilliant. And that was very, very frank to me of, okay, you know what you're going to be looking for. So I'm going to give you this misdirection long enough that I can get the jump on you. I mean, yeah. And for Billy and Billy having the knowledge to say, I know what's going on here. I'm turning my laser off. Yeah. I mean, and it made sense, you know, like realistically, which I know it's, it's comic book stuff, but it is realistic. And, you know, they're on an army base full of hundreds of soldiers. You're not going to start, start having a firefight in some guy's house because you're going to have like a hundred, you know, armed people come on you in like, you know, half a minute. Um, were those guys, I, because this, I think, got slightly askew, I think, um, later in these episodes, there are some mercs that are hired. Are they a part of this, or did Frank kill the guys? Is he and and this leads me to two two avenues. One is is he did he waste them with his knife? Because oh, I didn't know if these guys were the ones that Billy hires later. I kind of don't think they are because he was talking about they got stuff put up on YouTube, so basically no uh, military outfit would 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 touch them. So I'm I'm assuming that is not them. No, this, my, is, this, is, this is the group that, that Billy says he lost too many soldiers already. This is the group that he lost okay. that led him to need to recruit those crews. Okay, okay, okay. So Frank did waste them potentially with his knife. They left that actually pretty ambiguous. It, it, I yeah. know that there was the one guy that he clocked with the uh, David statue that was sitting on the table. So right. he's definitely I don't, out, but uh, okay. is he dead or not? I don't know. Again, it goes back to that question that Frank had of, these are soldiers doing their job. Do I kill them or do I leave, let them go? He could incapacitate them. He could injure them, sure. But was he required to kill them in that instance when he, he was just trying to get the phone clone and get away? I, yeah, because I, I, I would think in this case ahead. that the guys who came in for... Um, 
Bennett, Frank knows they're not the they're not the good soldiers, right? These aren't your base military guys coming in to kill the the Bennett. This is this is I don't know. This is a hit squad. I, I, that's how I took it. But maybe I, I can see yeah, what you're saying. I, I kind of thought the same thing after the fact because they're saying, well, we knew Rollins was going to come after us, or we knew they're going to watch Bennett because that was an, our next logical target. So then it kind of fit together of, oh, okay, they they knew it was a trap and they worked the way around it. Um, I I mean I. I personally think he probably didn't kill him, but I think that's just a comic book influence on me because Frank has a big thing about that in the comics. But also, uh, effectively doesn't matter, right? Because they've encountered the Punisher. Those soldiers, you know, you can't really use them again, even if they were still alive and functional, because at that point, how how do you know who you're going to keep quiet? What's going to, you know? Yeah. Like, But before we... Go ahead. Sorry. Man. I mean, you, see, you know what I'm saying? Like... It, you can't have U.S. troops engage Frank Castle too much, or else this all comes out. You definitely get the Punisher. If, if, if are you saying if they press him too much, then they will definitely engage Frank to a higher level. I'm saying that one encounter where a guy's sneaking around pummeling people, you can tell the soldiers you don't know what you saw, right? Like this could be any number of things, right? Uh, but if you if you keep doing that too much, and if they just keep engaging him at all, then it's going to be like too many people will will find out. It's going to be too big of a deal. Like you know, they're okay. oh okay okay. The cover up can't happen. Yeah, exactly. But before we leave the Bennett job, I I did want Do to it. kind of circle back to one other thing, and that's the um, the usage of the drones. Um, I try not to, <laughs> to I try to maintain my you know sense of this is a comic book based show and don't don't get too technical. But the the use of the drones on the military base kind of brought me out of it you know not not to get too critical but i keep wondering how do they have, how do they not have security to deal with that kind of thing i mean it's it's they, they just kind of took me out of it for a second yeah I, I think you can get caught in this use of drones and i just recently on a side note you know my daughter i bought her one and i fell in love with it and it doesn't have the best camera on it i end up getting my own and it's an amazing technology I'm also amazed at, I should say, the piloting skills or lack thereof. It does, I mean, only because I'm, I've been involved with it now for a little bit. Like keeping them up and having them do certain things is not easy. And I couldn't tell, did Frank turn uh, like a transponder on? That seemed to be for the phone, but I thought it was like to, for the drone to track him. That's kind of, I was allowing a, a couple levels of I'm not sure to just say, OK, I guess Micro is flying it because he flew it before. But because I, I didn't see that, I kind of just assumed like it was just floating over him. And let's not I mean, let's not forget there are drones and then there are drones, you know, like that's right. Like, I mean, it, it, it you can get like a hundred dollar piddly one or you can get like a fifty thousand dollar one. So. It, right. It wasn't so much the the drones and what they could do as the fact that the base just seemed to. I would I would assume a military base had some kind of mechanism to to detect the signals or something. But I'm probably overthinking I'm, it. I mean, honestly, how the most drones are controlled over like you know two point four or five gigahertz traffic, which is common as can be. So, um, I, I mean, I like like from a technical standpoint, I don't know how you would do it unless you were like literally like trying to optically find them somehow. And since they're small. Yeah, but but you bring up a great point, which is it is a base, and 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 so that 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 those those guys should be ready to go on an instant. So like as soon as like for example, when Billy starts shooting, that really should have you know caused a huge red alarm, which didn't seem to kind of happen at least the way I thought it would. Yeah, when Frank ends up breaking out of there, I mean, he only runs across one soldier in the tunnel as he's getting away. I mean, the base is not on on red alert. The, there's not spotlights on. There's no mass influx of personnel trying to to f- converge on on Bennett's place to figure out what's happening. He gets out the window. He gets down the tunnel, and he runs into one nervous soldier who. He's standing there with a rifle, ordering him to stand down, and Frank is looking at him going, you know, kid, I don't want to do this, and and we get that foreshadowed moment where Frank's got to make a choice, and he clips the kid, he wings him, 
He, but he doesn't like it. And it, it's the, the quote when he gets back to the van and they get away of, it's a lot easier when you can kill people. Of, of having to pause in that moment going, okay, I'm going to wound him. I'm not going to go center mass and just kill him. Even though Frank understands that this is, again, just another soldier doing his job. And he's a kid. There's no, there's no tactical value. There's no benefit to him offing this kid, but at the same time, he's just like, when, I, when you can just point and shoot, it's much easier, and that speaks to a lot of what Micro, I'm sure, disagrees with Frank when he just says, no, these people have just got to die. And, I mean, it does stretch credulity a little bit, but a gunshot is not the least common thing that happens on a military base. So if I if I stretch my mind a little bit, I can kind of see that without like an explicit call to alarm. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got you. It's not as if like the, all the rooms are you know have have a microphone on them, and that's immediately going to trip things off. Yeah. yeah you're and absolutely soldiers right. shoot. I mean, there are target ranges, there are practice areas. So I mean, hearing a gunshot on itself isn't going to necessarily. No, and and to. John's point, I grew up here in Massachusetts. There was a, an army training base, Fort Devens, no relation, uh, that was less than a quarter of a mile from where I lived before I moved out to the Pacific Northwest. And we had kids who I went to school with who were army kids. So my bus would go in on base and drop them off, and we'd be hearing artillery fire, and we'd be hearing gunfire from the ranges pretty common. Because you're a soldier, yeah, you're yeah. being trained to do that. Um, yeah, we'd always hear we'd always hear the grenade launchers over anywhere if you were in Onslow County and ca- near Camp Lejeune when they were doing uh, their trainings out there. You would hear, fum, 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 and then you'd hear pop, 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 because they were just unleashing the grenade launchers, which is a little scary to be honest with you. Yeah, but I mean that's why I'm saying like I think like some shooting probably wouldn't. Yeah. All right, I think uh, yeah, we're we're hitting this pr- pretty pretty difficultly, or uh, we're we're hitting it. Uh, and let's uh, move move to a different type of pressure cooker, um, <laughs> not the Instapot. Um, but we come back to Lewis, and Lewis is making an IED. He's you know doing the the hardware um, scramble, hardware store scramble, and building a bomb. And so we know this is not going to be good. But before that, we get that scene that you alluded to earlier with him and his dad watching the Rumble in the Jungle, the Ali Foreman fight from 74, which has a lot of interesting uh, lines that lead into this, where um, you know yes. Lewis says, whatever, as his dad is talking to him, he says, you know, I envy boxers. They know who their enemies are. They're standing right in front of them. And mm-hmm. his dad is explaining the concept of blunt force versus adaptability with Foreman versus Ali. Ali had the strategy, and he made it work even when the rest of the world wrote him off. And, and I am, I've been boxing since I was eight. So when they dropped this in here, I was like, ooh, okay, I, I know this whole line of theory very, very well. But, uh, and then Lewis's dad restates that he knows something is wrong with his son. He knows it. But he also says again, he doesn't know how to help him. And for the first time, you hear him say flat out, I'm scared, which mm-hmm. is not... And it's not something any parent ever likes to admit to anybody, let alone out loud vocalizing it, where you look at your child and you go, you're, it's such a loss for what to do. It's such a, a terrifying, painful place to be. But all you can do is just try and, and with words, just try and steer them in what you hope is the right direction. And obviously, as we see with what Lewis decides to do with what comes of that conversation he doesn't do it because he goes to the hardware store and we see what he starts putting together, which for me being here, I'm 20 miles from Boston and I have been down to the Boston Marathon site where those bombs went off. And those were pressure cooker bombs seeing this. And I was 3000 miles away watching that on TV when it happened. But even that was one where I, as soon as I saw it, my stomach just sunk, I was just like, no, Oh, man. And it wasn't a question of it being, you know, too soon or anything like that. But it was just, oh, OK, here we go. This is not going to yeah, be what, fun. What does a bomb do? What's its intention? Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and it's kind of ironic and, that, that that when he said, you know, he knows who the enemy is, they're standing right in front of him, but then he turns around and goes to like the more indiscriminate way of dealing with this problem and by blowing people up versus when Frank later is like, you know, I'm a Marine. You know, I killed, the, you know, I'm fighting somebody in front of me. You're a coward. You're bombing, you know, just randomly, you know. Yeah. And, it really sends Curtis and Frank into a real tizzy over bombs. And yeah, Lewis and, was overseas. I mean, he, he was, he was one of those guys over there dealing with the IEDs. So for him to have the mind flip of coming back and becoming a bomber himself, after having dealt with the bombs, you know, as a soldier, was amazing to me. It, it, they kind of used that that mind flip of him him changing roles. So, Ooh. I uh, I I think I've mentioned it before, but I lived in Beirut, Lebanon, in the early nineties. So I've seen what a bomb can do. Um, but this is actually one of my big complaints because I think they handled Lewis's breakdown pretty well up until even up until when he. Uh, killed O'Brien, right? And afterwards, like when he put the gun in his mouth, I found that all kind of, uh, like, that rang true. But I kind of don't buy getting to where he is from where he was. Like, I don't... I Okay, on a narrative level, I think I, can, I see where you're at, because the the boxing scene I think was supposed to have a lot more weight. And it did have weight. I'm not going to discount it. But there was something about it that didn't – it didn't translate well into – I think this is where you were going, is it didn't just make the switch happen. I think you know the key line was you know, you know, when your enemy's in front of you. And so that – and somehow Lewis takes that to, you know, I'm going – I need to get into the front lines. And later I, but on – there's. Go ahead. I said later on, when before Frank calls him a coward, what does he do? He tries to reason with them, right? He says, these aren't the decision makers. These are, yeah. these are grunts. These are people like you, right? They, they, they had no part in this, right? Before, he, like, he's trying, I mean, I don't see how that argument didn't work on him. Like, that kind of just rank false. Yeah, I mean, I, I can kind of head cannon it away that he's been beaten down by the system, quote unquote. So he, he's going up against the system. He's, he's targeting the establishment, the... The, the not people making the rules, but like the the overall, you know, architecture of the of what's he thinks is the problem versus uh, and he's, cr- where, and he's Frank the is wake going, up, yeah the right, wake up call right whereas Frank is more you know he's got a specific purpose he's going after specific people whereas Lewis is more yeah it's just the nebulous you know the man well and if yeah. I can if, and if I can backtrack yeah. it you think about where Lewis starts at he starts in the group the group doesn't give him the help that he's looking for as, as well intentioned as Curtis is. Then O'Connor steps in and starts steering him in the way that O'Connor wants to manipulate him to get his own agenda done. And what does he run into? He gets arrested and O'Connor's not there to help him. Then he goes to um, Anvil. He talks to Russo. He th- figures that's his way out. He'll go back into the military through private means. Curtis undercuts that Billy lets him go. So Every avenue he's tried has been a roadblock, and now he's at home just trying to figure out what he can do, and his dad has no answers other than, you're smart, you'll figure it out. Um, you know, you just have to adapt. You've tried the, the direct route, now you're going to have to go in a different way. And so Lewis, over the span of these first seven episodes, we've seen him try all these different avenues and have been hit with roadblocks every single one of them. And now I think after killing O'Connor and where his frame of mind is at that point, all right, I'm going to just – I will make my declarative he, he's, statement. He, yeah, he's reached point of no return. That if, the, if, the, if the, the boxing scene happened before that, maybe he gets we – can, we, can, we can rehabilitate him. But at this point, he's beyond, he's beyond that. He's beyond reasoning. Sure, and I could buy that as him going against uh, – Russo or going like I mean he does eventually you know attack Curtis but like I could see him going against those people right I just I I mean we're probably just gonna have to agree to disagree I just don't see the indiscriminate bombing I don't see where he comes to that conclusion yeah no I I would agree with you that that going from from that point to what we get with the pressure cooker bomb and especially what happens at the beginning of, of episode eight there is a big leap there that not everybody can 
can make. And and I'm there with you, Sean. I'm I was like, wow, he he skipped some levels there to go straight from where he was to that. But I think it was because and in, in kind of trying to put my head in the space of the writers of, well, now we need a dramatic action. This is relevant to our, our discourse over the last five, six years. We'll have him do this. Yeah, and I know they need it narratively to kind of contrast and uh, make Frank a little bit more sympathetic. but Or at least yeah. more like understandable, but I don't know. If we, yeah, if I, we, I don't want to jump too far ahead. ahead, but it was kind of also interesting. I caught this on the second watch through where when Frank and um, Billy are talking... Um, um, Frank and Lewis are talking uh, that Lewis is upset that you know Karen Page is using her you know freedom of the press to you know go after people like him or disparage people you know say whatever she wants and you know the senators you know saying what he wants against people that you know he doesn't agree with whereas that's your First Amendment right whereas he's up against he's he's mad about people infringing on his Second Amendment rights it's like you know it's part of the Bill of Rights you can't have it both ways where you know your rights better than you know, another right, which yeah, I thought was kind of interesting. He's oh, definitely, he's definitely not a stable individual. There's, there's no doubt he's, uh, uh, yeah, not on the same. Yeah, do you, do you weigh, else. do you weigh, yeah, do you weigh one thing heavier than the other when it's all encompassing into one document? That's a really great argument uh, and a really great point. Um, let, let's tie up this one with some loose ends. We. Billy is putting the colonel in a safe house and basically sets him up, gives him uh, a little dead dominatrix, and he gets wasted to eliminate that little thread. And Frank knows now where Agent Orange lives. And in a great cliffhanger, uh, pulls out his 50 cal and is lined up for an uh, just a, a beyond a, a 0. 0.0 kill shot and that glass is absolutely bulletproof and Rollins sees you know I I can't imagine what it would feel like to see that glass just shatter right in front of you did you yeah. notice that Rollins didn't flinch oh. yeah he, he was just kind of just like you know, oh, just another day drinking my coffee, looking out the window. <laughs> and he stayed there. He kept, he didn't, he didn't go somewhere else. He stayed right there in front of that bullet hole. So, yeah, and, and it, was, it was fun to watch the bullet, but the bullet like, you know, hit the window and just kind of just like, bloop, fall out. Yeah, so, yeah. So this actually annoyed me. <laughs> because. <laughs> to the center. <laughs> no, because as much as this show has been accurate about gunplay. Yeah. Yes. Bulletproof I, glass. There is no amount of bulletproof glass that stops a 50 caliber bullet. Yeah, and even if it, by some miracle it did, you would run away because there's no chance in hell it would stop the second one. That was the first thing I thought was why not just send a second yeah. round? But right, go ahead. And, you're already you're already in line. Go ahead and throw it downfield. But yeah, like, I, I mean, think- a fifty a fifty caliber round is like orders of magnitude, literally orders of magnitude more uh, more force yeah, transfer th- than like a handgun be- round. Right, it gets like has uranium depleted rounds. See, but as the MythBusters proved, if you were in three feet of water, you'd be fine. Oh, uh, so you're saying there's water? Glass. There's water in the glass? That's that's cool. Yeah, yes. but <laughs> actually, dude, that exact same episode proved that bulletproof glass would not stop a fifty cal. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, but, and I guess we're also in in the world of you know aliens, technology, and you know vibranium. Uh, I was just going to say that yeah. this is Tony yeah. Stark's world, kind of. You know, go the go the, the comic booky, yeah. Special special glass substance, but and you know. I I'm not too big of a like I usually don't nitpick unless the show invites it. So I'm just saying because Punisher has been so like tried to be so good about it, transparent adamantium. That's <laughs> yeah, the ticket, go. laddie. <laughs> well, yeah. and you not what I'm saying, any- like if if this were Daredevil, I wouldn't mind because Daredevil isn't trying to be really intricate and like accurate about its weapons. Not to take anything away from the the, the 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 shot there, but I do want to back up to the the Russo um, Bennett murder there. Yes, was that the first um, appearance of Billy's wrist knife? Because I thought it has that was, to be that was you know nice foreshadowing to go ahead and whip that out and show his uh, aptitude with his concealed blade there. Uh huh. And I wonder 
Again, I don't know much about Jigsaw. Is that a Jigsaw tool? I don't think it is, but again, my, my Jigsaw knowledge is a bit rusty. No, I just I just reread all of Punisher Max in the last week to to kind of get context. Uh, no, Jigsaw is basically Frank with scars on his face. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I was you know I wasn't sure if that was it was if that was a deliberate thing. When I saw that in the notes, I was like, I wonder if maybe somehow Jigsaw that's his like tool of choice, and so we're getting. I know this leads us into. Eventually, Billy killing Stein with the exact same knife. Right. It was Chekhov's and, knife. Exactly. And we get more pageantry of the knife when Frank does his uh, child psychology uh, time. And in, in, actually, in episode eight, Blue Steel, which we're kind of on right now. Right. But before that, we finally get the point where Frank, um, at, realizing that he hasn't killed Rollins... They at least figure out who he is. I, Agent Orange right. is unmasked, but while they're trying to figure that out, all of a sudden the lights go out at the Lieberman's house, and now Frank has got to resume the role of Pete. And I, the interesting part of this was seeing Frank's calm in that situation versus Micro's panic of Micro sitting there saying, "You've got to get over. You got to get over. You got to." And, and Frank is trying to keep him calm, but Micro, you. It's so blatantly obvious that his ability to be a voyeur in his own house and having his his reliance on that and almost his his addiction to it at this point, because it keeps him grounded to what he needs to do to get back there, just how quickly all of a sudden his mind is starting to figure out, okay, why is it off? Why can't I see the feed? What's going on over there? What happened to my wife? What happened to my kids? Oh, my God, Frank, get over. Get, get over there, Frank. And Frank's like, dude, I'll go check it out. Calm down. Uh, does he bring the flowers over at that particular moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's his excuse for for dropping by to apologize for like I guess ditching her on the on the dinner. Okay, gotcha. Tra- yeah. Trade trade her flowers for the garbage bag. But this is not. Th- this is kind of like, hey, I'm just going over there to be good, Pete, and be helpful. Have a little rosé, and I'll fix your Wi-Fi for you real quick because this. She then, Sarah then, will call him because obviously there's not a whole lot of male figures that she knows in this panic because her son is really acting out. Right. But before that, when the cameras come back on, what does Micro see? He sees Sarah kiss Frank. Yep. And is that when it happens? Yep. yep. And that's, yeah. yep. that's exactly it. Yep. Yep. Um, and, 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 and we have that point in the before that where you see. <laughs> Where again, Micro has gone to the fridge and he's got this nice big club sandwich sitting there. And what is he doing with it? Yeah, the sandwich is the sandwich is definitely definitely the pineapple of of the the Punisher series, where you just keep getting sandwiches thrown around. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. but yeah, but he is such a mess at that point that he, he even he can't even eat because he is so freaked out about what's going on. And then all of a sudden, the cameras are back on. Great, I'm sw- wait a minute. What is my wife doing? Right. Okay. And the one thing I really liked about that scene is it was very obvious uh, his wife kissing Frank. Yes. And uh, like, and when I put myself in her mindscape, right? Mm-hmm. You know, to her, Micro's dead. Um, this is a person who's genuinely nice and kind, and you know, is kind of in a similar boat as you know. And so I can kind of, like, I get where she was coming from, right? Um, and Absolutely. I, and Frank's kind of awkward shock was probably the only acceptable reaction that I would have had to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, granted, he knows that there are cameras in the house. This is not something that he wants at all. Um, and undoubtedly, Micro is going to be upset by this. I mean, he went right to the bottle, which in my mind makes perfect sense. I'm I'm locked locked away. I can't come out. You know, I'm going to dive into a bottle because I'm 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 beyond sad. And she's doing the same thing. Um what I really liked is these whole scenes where uh Micro flippantly says, Go see your girlfriend. And Frank 
I mean, all facial expression drops and says, "What we're going to have a conversation right now. This is not what you what you think it is, nor do I accept it in any way, shape, or form. I love my wife. That's who I love. And again, this is where in a lesser show, this would have become the thing that like, then we see micro teaming up with Rollins or something, right? Like if this were like, like, like on a jealousy level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Michael kind of gets it. Like, I mean, at, by the end, he's joking about you kiss my wife kind of, you know, but like, y- you know what I mean? Like an actual adult who understands the situation yeah. would be, I mean, yes, upset initially, but when they actually stopped and thought about it, they wouldn't be, uh, you know. Th- would, this would have been, been a soap opera narrative yeah, on yeah. a lesser show. Yeah. This would be, become a main, a main piece to a... I'll even say it, a CW show, for instance. And, and instead of that, you get the, the bonding with them, you know, sitting in, in Frank's room, you know, drinking on the cots, you know, having their banter back and forth. And to me, that's, you know, despite all the great other things in the show, I really enjoy the the interactions between the two of them when they're not being antagonistic. Oh, and absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That scene, the scene earlier in the van where they were just, you know, bantering back and forth. It, it, those things just make make the show for me. And that was that was one of my favorite um scenes of the entire three series that we were three episodes we're reviewing here is was the just that micro getting drunk and, and Frank sitting with him and, and the bonding moment they got there. Yeah, but it yeah, was interesting the, 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 when you juxtapose that over the next morning when Frank wakes up <laughs> and he's banging away, I love how he, how micro comes out of the hangover and you just hear that bang, bang, <laughs> bang. And it's just the spoon on a bowl, but they amplified it. So it's like, you know, he's ringing a cowbell. Um, but how Frank's mood just turns on a dime when micro gives him that jab again of well you better go see your girlfriend and 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 the conviction in frank's voice because again mm-hmm. it's and it's not just the fact of dude i don't want your wife he explains exactly what why he was with maria how they came together and what he did to make that relationship work and the the undeniable reality of look i don't want your wife this is why i don't want your wife and and every time Micro interjects, Frank just would you just shut up and listen for a minute? Yeah, he says, I don't want to hear it because you're going to understand this right now, and we're not going to have this conversation again. All right, my job is to get you back to her. I am not going to be a part of that equation. Now, if you bring it up again, I'm going to make you swallow your tongue. But that's it. And once Micro understands that, it's like okay, we're good. But- Eric, what were you going to say? I was going to say, in this episode particularly, they had a couple good places where, you know, you as the audience knew where it was going to go. You know, so you knew Sarah was going to kiss Frank, but then they, they kind of twist it where it's at, when Micro is like, well, yeah, I, I can see that. I, that. I would probably do, you know, I, I agree, you know, I would agree with what you did. That was a surprise. Like, you would think, yeah, like you said before, that would, he would be all pissed or try to take a swing at Frank, you know, which he did for something else, but not for that. And then later when... You know, Sam runs off to try to catch the last guy. You know, you know what was going to happen, and then how they dealt with that after the fact, where you would think like maybe like Madani was going to get comforted by her mom, and you know, twist it's Billy. You know, so they did a good job of like you know giving you a little left turn after you kind of already knew where you thought it was going to go. Yeah, and while we're at this, because we spent so much time on the kiss, uh, I think we should dive deeper into what we've been calling Frank's child psychology session. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's do it. Because uh, I mean, that was a pretty significant. Uh, he like one thing I've noticed is he seems to interact with his daughter and um, and Micro's daughter a lot better than he interacted with his son and Micro's son. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and he kind of I mean he he kind of goes off the deep end there for a little minute. Yeah, it almost gets real. Um, like if you asked, um, if if you put like taxi driver into a child psychology lesson, uh, <laughs> it it was, you know, I was really I didn't know how this was going to go. I, I tried to get in the mindset of like if someone asked me to talk to their child, and you know, and the fact that he says you know you need to walk away for a little bit, and I was like you know this is really this is really going to go poorly. Um, and I was not expecting, 
uh, the case in point is that that what's his son's name? Zach. Zach. Zach has a K bar. Uh, in his bag, and he's been keeping it there. And we know that he's been bullying and and and, and kind of coming to a, a point of uh, very violent in, in his in his nature. Um, and he's been bullying kids around. And Frank kind of gives us a little bit of a pageantry of the knife uh, in that he would rather have a knife in a gunfight because he can close the distance and he can you know, slit it and and pull it and, and make its mark. And this kid at first, well, it, it you know, Frank tries his best to kind of get in the kid's uh, head and saying, yeah, you know, Wu-Tang, they're on that next level shit. Um, and tries to, you know, tries to kind of equalize themselves to have a conversation. And then realizing that Frank, Frank doesn't really, he can't do that at this point. And so he goes into, let me go to Frank plus one, which is, you know, his next level, which is scaring the bejesus out of somebody. Well, I mean, he's, he's teaching the lesson in a, in a very, very aggressive way that weapons don't equal power. All right. The distiller makes his mark right there. Yeah. Sean Shibley. And, uh, I mean, so, I mean, that's what he's teaching. And, um. I mean, I think the lesson kind of hits home, even though aggressively applied. Uh, something else that a quote I love is, crazy doesn't respond to logic, crazy responds to fear. Hmm. Yeah, this is ex- not exactly how Dr. Spock drew it up when he was trying to explain to parents, this is how you deal with a, a, a kid who's slightly unhinged. But that point where he's got the knife to his neck and, and he's... You know, you feel powerful now, huh? You feel like a tough guy now? And Zach just looks at him and says, just do it. Where he doesn't yeah. care. He is so bereft uh, over what his life has become and the fact that his dad's gone and what's happened to his family and all that stuff that he'd rather that Frank just get on with it. And it's that moment where Frank hears that, that you see him immediately just put the K-bar down and start to console him and be like, you know, it, and it's that same moment that we've seen earlier in the series where you've seen him chastise his own son, and then two seconds later realize, no, that wasn't, I shouldn't have done it that way. But he can't take it back, but now he has to understand that he's got to step back from that and go, nope, I, that was too far. And it's interesting mm-hmm. now when you see that, and I, had, I didn't equate it until now, how he handles that situation towards what we get over the next couple of uh, hours worth of, of, of story time with Lewis, where he's in another situation with another lost kid. What does he do? Well, and, and to also look at the, the thematic way that they present that <laughs> conversation, because it's cut back and forth between that and the, um, and well, I'm sure we'll get to it in a bit, the, the operation, uh, Madani's operation where they set the trap. But those two, those two sequences are cut back and forth. They flip back and forth between the two. And I, I took that as you're seeing the family bully, which is Zach. You know, you've seen him hit Leo. You've seen his, his reaction. His mom's found the knife. They consider him a, a bully. And yet when it comes down to it, he's just a scared kid who's hurting. And then you get the, um, the, the hit squad fight with Madani's group. And who's the real bully? You see how Billy handles that situation yeah oh in fact i mean look billy there's there's a little bit of code of character in there that he's hired these mercs and in order to preserve preserve his own uh skin his you know his lifestyle he pushes one of the mercs to take uh, a bullet for his so he can escape and then kills another one again on his way out so you know Billy, at that point, for me, that is a huge changeover. Like I could, I can get around certain aspects, but that seemed to be the ones like you are expendable. And he's actually flipped the coin where he was once the expendable uh, asset, and so he, he's there, there's this like this power level that that has has tripped him up. And the third time we see a marine go too far with a knife. Quite true. And it, I mean, it, you know, Frank kind of explained it, and then we got to see it. 
Yeah, if there was one small gripe I have about that shootout, it was <laughs> it, it was the fact that, that, and it's not to suggest at all because I have seen women who are very capable with a shotgun. But there were times in that shootout where I look at Madani where she's firing rounds off, and I'm like, your shoulder should be four feet behind you. With Especially the way that with thing those broken kicked. ribs. Yeah, I didn't like the fact that they gave her a shotgun. I mean, uh, just on a logistical level, it just doesn't... I mean, again, I don't have a whole lot of experience at this, but it just seems to me if you're going into a firefight, you're not going to take something that maybe holds 10 rounds. Well, since we're talking about the firefight, that the whole setup, and I realized she was working with the resources she probably could get on the false report she, she put in, but they Where saw... Where were they? Right. I mean, they, they, they'd seen the carnage in Kentucky, and now here they are with you know not near enough resources to handle the group. Who are they expecting to show up? Yeah. I, I actually, uh, just a little bit on point, Mo's, um, shotguns are very common as the heavier weapon for most law enforcement agencies. Um, that aren't like military because A, you have to load it with different sorts of uh, shells pretty easily and B, just that the uh, pump sound often is enough to dissuade. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually believe that that's just what they had because, you know. Yeah, you figure in any firefight, you're going to need a heavy gunner. And and I, if honestly, I was more stunned that Sam was standing there with just a pistol yeah. Than, than she had with her shotgun. But it was one of those where the way that she was lining up to shoot, I was like, wait a minute. It, 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 no, if you're going to hold it that way, you're, you're going to break something. So uh, given her stature. Yeah, that, and yeah, it was actually this scene that I thought, this, this, this particular scene, it was, it was cut in on the teaser, and I thought for sure this was Madame Gao. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen any further. There is no Madame Gao at all. Thankfully. This, yeah, this has no connection and is not burdened by um, MCU uh, clickbait. Man, if uh, I'm done with the hand. Yeah, well, the, well, the I, hand's I, I done think, with I the hand. I think they're all dead now. All those ninjas are gone, so we're good. Yeah, I mean, if if it... If there had to have been anybody from Defenders that had come in, I would have been okay with Gao, or I would have even been okay if there had been a, a tieback to Fisk in some way, but this didn't need it. And, and again, it goes back to what I said in, in the previous War Journal about how we didn't have um, Rosario Dawson wasn't involved in this, because she didn't need yeah. to be. It was like, okay, we can give these guys a series off. That's fine. Give me new characters that are, are interesting and can fill those roles, but are still compelling enough that I want to see where they go as well. I, we thought, I thought episode 10 was the, the Punisher Iron Fist team up. Did I miss that? Uh, yes, okay. you did. So let's just go ahead and leave that alone. I don't want to ever hear about that again. But, I, I could not even fathom having Iron Fist and uh, Frank together. That would make my head explode. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, we have Karen, which is a connection. Um, and if we had to have a defender, the only one I would even remotely see who wouldn't just grab Frank and throw him some in jail would maybe be Jessica, or maybe even Luke Cage. Yeah, so, maybe. But Luke would just be like not in my neighborhood, and that would be the beginning and end of his. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is quite a bit of Karen going on, uh, in, is it in this episode or more in the next? I think it's more in, in, more in nine, but yeah. 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 But we, we do have, you know, Karen kind of getting, uh, is the manifesto dropped in eight? No, it's, uh, it is in nine. Okay, let's hold off on 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 that end yet, because but but it is interesting that that Karen gets brought in because of her connection with Frank. I mean, she's already been brought in by Madani, but um, that Lewis makes that 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 leap as well and saying, "Well, wait a minute, you're you 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 get this, you understand." Yeah, but it was interesting how this this one starts out with not with Karen but with Madani. In the aftermath of uh, what happened at the end of episode eight, which again ties back to the beginning of episode seven, where you have Madani in the bathtub 
with blood all over her, and it's Sam's blood, but who's there to clean it off? Yes. Billy's there. And you can see, but unlike Lewis, who is, he's just a blank slate. You can't really read the emotion that he's got. Madani is visibly emotionally in shock. She is gone because her partner is gone again. She lost Zubair at the beginning of the episode of the series, and now Sam is gone. And she doesn't realize it, but the guy that killed him is there washing the blood off. So when she wakes up, her hands and face are clean. And I know I liked how the camera opens up pretty much on those two shots. But you can tell inside that she is a mess. And her mother tries to help her out this time. It's not Billy. But you have the the scenario of, of trying to of how she explains how in the, sh- the firefight, everything went so slowly against when Sam was there dying and she was there, everything went so fast. And it mm-hmm. was the idea of the combat stress where everything, it's like in a car crash, everything slows down, where you're seeing somebody there and you want to help them, but you can't, and everything seems to speed up. It was I like that, that contrast and comparison. But also, while you look out the window, who's there on the, across the way, but there's Frank and Micro. And I liked Frank's line to Micro about how to approach Madani, which we didn't touch on, but that was something that had been brought up in the previous episode about how Micro finally got to Frank of, we need to bring Madani in. That, mm-hmm. that, that's the way to get this figured out. We've got to bring her in. And at first, Frank's resistant to it. But after the drunk conversation, he's like, fine, okay, we'll do it. But I liked Frank's line of, we get only one shot at this, so we have to treat her like a high-value target, which means you know, you, you have no doubt that you have the right approach to get what you need out of it. But then, of course, before we get to that point, we get bombs going off. Yes, that was really unexpected. Uh, you know, you have you have uh, Micro getting ready to do his uh, <laughs> pee in the orange juice jug. Um, so I guess they've been staking the place out overnight. Well, that jug was pretty full. So, yeah, I guess they would be there for a while. Yeah. I would say so. I, I it just you know it that's like those little details I think are so so just critical and clutch. But then to have that explosion go off because we've seen explosions in in the MCU and th- this was you know I I, I I I tread lightly on saying realistic, but it's not this big fiery ball. It's 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 the dust, it's the debris, and it's really slightly even almost out of frame from where Frank is. And I do want to say, because my son brought this up, he's like, wow, the shots with um, Billy, Bennett, and Rollins had a real, like, Mr. Robot vibe. There is some really interesting Mr. Robot kind of compositions being laid in on a, I, it, it seems like that has definitely permeated the the TV uh, viewing experience. I, I love it. Well, Believe I, me. That's what a pressure cooker bomb is, right? It's yeah. not you, – you're not focused on it. The whole point is that you're not focused on it. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's not the, – the idea is it, it's anywhere and you don't know where it is and there's chaos and stuff that it causes. Yeah. Well, and I like the use of the – the non-series characters, if that makes sense, the the video we see of the bomb going off of the Etni office. Uh, it, oh, because yeah. Because you're, you know, we, we're so used to our characters, the characters that we've seen throughout the entire series, you know, getting beat up, getting blown up, getting shot at, whatever. But to see it as a, you know, non-action hero character and the explosion affecting them really makes it hit home more than just okay, it's another action scene for our characters. And also, I mean, I think this is how. This series kind of avoids the uh, episode nine drag, so to speak, because you're kind of introducing this uh, this third party, not really, not really related to the interests of either the other two people in the conflict parties in the conflict, kind of an agent of chaos. So it's kind of starting a third plot thread, right? Yeah. You know, three quarters through. Yeah, and what I liked about it was. There, I mean, yes, we got the foreshadowing of Lewis building the bombs, but there was nothing about where he placed them. There was nothing going back to anything uh, in his plan other than that was where we left him, which meant 
at some point, a lesser writer would say, okay, well, we got to show him figuring out where he's going to put him and picking his targets and all this and all that. Instead, we get Frank Micro looking at something totally unrelated to Lewis and bang. And, it yeah, just, and, and the randomness of it was like, whoa, what the heck was that? And then all of a sudden you realize yeah. it was, oh, okay, Lewis has been busy. And one of the things that really, really got me about it was when I saw him the first time building the bomb, right? I was sure. convinced that was for Russo. Like, I, I thought, oh, yeah, that's for Russo. There was no other, like... Oh, interesting that, that you saw it as a misdirect. Yeah, because, I mean, Russo's the one who kind of pushed him out of the fold. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I hadn't even considered it was anything else. Right. And, and I looked it over, and it, I double-checked it when they said it was the ATF building, the NYPD 10th Precinct at the Federal Courthouse. I went back to the middle, or the um, episode 5, to when he got arrested and tried to figure out what precinct did that cop come from. And there was nothing on his uniform to say 10th Precinct. So, and he was in front of the city courthouse, not the federal courthouse. So I was like, okay, then he picked different targets to, to prove his point. But then you get the, the David Fincher shot from Zodiac of the manifesto in the cart being pushed into Karen Page's office right after that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which I loved, because I love Zodiac. That's, that's one of my favorite movies of the last 20 years. Well, yeah, and then so now here we we actually are bringing Karen into in, into the mix, um, and she is the um, you know in a way she became the spokesperson for Frank in Daredevil, and well, I mean obviously now she's she's connected to him uh, in so far as I guess they would be. I mean they're they're they're, they're great friends. It seems like I mean obviously. He doesn't want anything to happen to her, almost on a level of family. He point like blank when, calls her family. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then there that there it is. But I remember that. that I think this was in that it wasn't really an argument, but it was basically like Micro trying to calm him down and pull him back. And he was like, "No, nothing's going to happen to her. Not on my watch." And I love Micro. the fact that I love the fact that he could not. That was a point where we saw Frank unable to articulate that. If you go yeah. back and watch that scene where he, he's stammering, he's at a loss for words. He's, he finally gets to the point where he just slams his hand down on the desk and is like, no, we are right. not Micro's, doing this. Micro's trying to say, look, you know, you're, you're comparing her to my wife. You know, who is she? And, and that, that was Frank's response was she is family, right? She's, she's yeah. the same level. And I kind of like that one moment where, like, Frank really – doesn't exactly understand how Micro does what he does. Because oh, he's like, there's yeah. a boy, Lewis, computer, yeah. find him. And Micro's right, like, right. uh... <laughs> yeah, that, that Boolean search will yield uh, some pretty stagnant, stagnant results or a, uh, a, heap, of, a heap of names. Um, yeah, the, one other thing that, like, I, I like that whole idea that, that Frank becomes almost to the point of raging to inarticulate. That make that makes a lot of sense, and it it, it kind of like lets you kind of know where where his break points are, and lesser shows again. Let let I want to kind of delve into that. Is that I almost posed the question, and I think I already know the answer. I mean, because again, it's not a lesser show. Is in a lesser show, Frank would be in love with Karen. Instead, he loves Karen, and there's. A huge distinction. Oh, massive. And and I don't think he's raging so much is that it, it is that emotional connection that he has to her that is yeah. bringing him to that point where he doesn't care what he, he about what needs to happen to get it done. He wants it done because, again, he she is his one of his last tethers to his own humanity. And well, the fact that he's not going to. F- well, yeah, He's and the fact gonna... that, that through Daredevil Season 2 that she had defended him and stuck up for him and stood by him and listened to him and, and was there understanding why he became what he did, that matters enough to Frank that, that he will never let that go. And that's and not, not a bad thing. Let, he's not going to let a daughter die a second time. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's... 
I mean, that's kind of what it is. It's it's tapping back into like another one of his children basically is in is in uh, is in peril. Right. But I do like the fact that Karen pushes back on that a bit when they have their conversation over the phone after he finds Lewis of when she's there and the FBI is there and she's like, look, just tell me who he is. I've got the FBI right here. I can go do it. And she's like, nope, my way's faster. And she says, no, then, then you're no different than Lewis. She doesn't give him his name, but she's like, then you're no different than the bomber. And don't. then she gets pissed off and says, don't say this is for me. And Frank's like, well, fine, but you're not going to like it. Because there, there was so much weight in that, uh, that exchange. That, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, and the fact that Frank, I, I, let's move it forward just a little bit. And Frank gets, um, he, you know, he's talking to Karen while she's on the radio and saying, oh, don't do this. You're, you're pushing him too far. Now, in fact, he kind of does the same thing. This whole idea of like, you know, coming out and saying you're a coward. The, that radio show, I'm not sure. How did you guys feel about that? I'm, 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 I'm a little up in the air. Like I just, I felt it was like, it, it's there for some sort of purpose, I guess, because we have to learn that there's Senator Ori, right? Yeah, I, I yeah, was on the Ricky Langtree show. I'd listen to that. But that's just me. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it also connects to, you He know, needs not to touch his mic, though. I'll just say that his mic skills are weak. <sighs> well, he uh, likes the sliders, too. You know, he likes the sliders. Kind of yeah. going, going back to the uh, argument Karen had with her uh, editor about publishing the manifesto or not. Right. Yes. Like, so I think Karen felt the need to kind of be public because, you know, even if she couldn't publish the manifesto, like she wanted her name on it. So she wants to be the name on this issue. Right. Um, and also, I think Frank is trying to draw Lewis's fire to him from Karen. Yeah. And, and I thought that in that whole conversation at the radio studio, I thought that Ori was the way he was done was way too ham fisted. And mm-hmm. um, Mike question was why not bring in trish walker for that yeah i was thinking the same thing i was, I was like kind of cool to circle back to her but well and and because if you think to the back at the end of of defenders where she was trying to that her character was trying to go that way but she was getting kind of slapped down by her her corporate uh overlords but i was thinking okay if you're gonna have a, a tie-in okay bring trish in for that but it's what it is but I liked how Karen did not bite at the carrots that Ori was dangling in front of her about all of his rhetoric of, uh, you know, because this wasn't a gun situation. This was a bomb situation. And she has, through her own experience, she's not buying what that guy is selling. I did love the fact, though, when, when Ori calls out that Frank's killed 37 people and Micro goes, 37? And then Frank goes, that they know about. <laughs> yeah, I have was, that line written down too. Was, yeah, I also like the the callback. That's back. the best line of the whole series. Yeah, when, yeah. In, when, in, in a in a crazy way, that was that even went all the way back to Clerks for me. Thirty seven. Shut up, Randall. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> and I'll leave that there. Well, when, and when when Ori calls out Karen about you know you know you wouldn't again ham fisted as it was that you know you don't see the need for for a gun to to protect yourself do you and i had the, the flashback to daredevil season one when she shoots the the guy there and it was like yeah well yeah wrong person she's seen that you know she's been there yep so uh this also breaks away into our boy curtis who again is trying to help trying to find because obviously he's got something go- he's like mm, this doesn't sound good i want to find out where lewis is and uh ends up going to o'connor's house and breaks down the door because he obviously smells something awful. And I can't even fathom what that must have smelled like because it seems like we're now dealing with at least uh, three or four days um, it, it's bet- not between fun. things happening. I, yeah. I've had to go out on police calls when I was still doing journalism work where even being in the vicinity of, of a murder scene doors are not as as great a barrier to the stench as people like to think and yeah it's i wouldn't wish that on my worst enemies and i w- i wasn't expecting the brawl that we got um with between lewis and curtis but 
I mean, because that was pretty, pretty brutal. I thought Curtis was dead. I thought, or he was going to be. I mean, I think yeah, we yeah, were me led too. to believe that. He I feel like that they been. showed they showed how capable Curtis was, though. I mean, until he got the leg sweeped out from underneath him, he was he was dominating the fight oh, yeah. as he should have. So that was and, that was nice. One thing that got to me, you know, Curtis is pretty much the only unequivocally good character in this show. Yes. Okay. I can get behind that. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, everyone else is shades of gray, but Curtis, he's like, he's, you know, his hands aren't tainted in any way. And for Lewis to, you know, be so far gone that he's attacking the one person who legitimately cared about him. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. That in in the whole scene where um yeah, when Lewis gets the upper hand and starts beating him with the leg, I thought he was dead too. And that was that goes all the way back to episode one with the showdown with the three construction guys and when Frank's got the hammer. I'm like, you just tagged him upside the head with a full swing with a sledgehammer. That guy's yeah. dead. You hit him in the yeah. back with a sledgehammer. That guy's dead. But then you but go all the way him- back to but then when you go all the way back to like Daredevil and all that stuff, the way that I like the fact that in the Netflix universe, they are more visceral with this sort of thing. But at the same time, it's like, I remember watching Daredevil going, oh, that guy be dead, that guy be dead, that guy be dead, because they're getting bashed upside the head all the time. But But Does anybody know, is the actor that plays Curtis, is he he really missing a leg? Do not know, but I might be able to find out. What okay, I, well, we can go ahead and throw that to the Googler. What I did like, though, is I loved the the when Frank comes in and finds him, and he's obviously strapped up with the claymore on his chest, the makeup they used on him to oh, make him look oh that God. beat up, that was some of the best makeup I've seen in any Marvel series so far, when you've seen a guy get beat up, because that was about as realistic as you can get. Yeah, I, I, that was really daunting, like, to see how bad he was injured. Now, there is a caveat to that, because sometimes when you do that, it's very hard to show the next time we see Curtis, um, he's fairly healed up, which is always a problem in my mind, and it always lets me know, like, is this, are you trying to tell me that time has passed? Because... You know, a lot of the that kind of like your eye sealed up that much. That's going to take a couple of days to come down at minimum. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I've, I've like I said, I, I've been boxing since I was eight, and I got into one of the things when I was a kid was me and my brothers when we were learning how to do it. You uh, have to learn how to move your head, and before you do that, you take shots to the face. And I've had ones where I've gotten popped in the in the eye, and it has closed over, and it hasn't gone down for two or three days where it, cause that puffiness will start to, to kind of l- lighten up, but it does take a while. So yeah, he's going to be, Curtis is going to be on the mend for a bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, and sometimes like with things like that, I kind of, I mean, I kind of chalked that up to narrative short, shorthand. Uh, with, in what regard? Like, with TV shows, like, technical details bug me, but sometimes, like, I kind of factor in a little bit for, like, you know, time's passing faster than it should, because... Right. And then, obviously, to see to see Curtis's eyes, both of them, it allows him, the actor, to, to do what he needs to do. You know, if you're really clobbered up with makeup, it, 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 it kind of keeps you wooden. Plus, from a practical standpoint, for all we know, they were research and they simply didn't have the time to put them in the makeup. Yeah, yeah, quite true. Uh, I did like the improvised explosive on him. I thought, however, everybody seems to be able to get burner phones like on a dime and to have a phone on Curtis to call. Okay. I felt like that was a little sneak in the grass. Like, wow, Lewis is really. Either he's thinking this through, but you've shown me not a lot that he thinks things through. Well, and I like the fact that when it came to that, he called uh, Curtis's phone, not that phone. Because when it first started ringing, I thought it was that phone on the bomb. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. And, they, and they point gotcha. to that phone first. They, they look over and they, you see that phone. And then Curtis, Frank looks at Curtis. He goes, what is it? He goes, it's my phone. It's in my pocket. 
So when you look at it, he pulls it out, and it's an unlisted number, but it's Curtis's phone. It's not a burner phone. Okay, okay. That seals that up. What yeah, I yeah, also like, I mean, liked was, was that Frank, this is a case where Frank doesn't have the answers. He's in a pickle because he's, he's looking over the, the IED and he's like, uh, this, this isn't my forte. I don't know bombs. I know guns. I don't know bombs. And, and he's kind of trying to piece it together, but he's looking at Curtis. He's like, dude, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. Yeah, they were actually conver- in their conversations going back through their training. You know, do you remember this? Do you remember that? I thought that was kind of nice. They showed, you know, we're, we're trying to think about it, but we're not experts here. Yeah, and I like just how this all plays in with the title of the episode. Which we should say is Front Toward Enemy. Yep. Which is quite pre- profoundly on the front of that Claymore mod and Curtis. Yeah. yeah, which I guess is the next question of where did Lewis get his hands on a Claymore? Well, yeah, it, it was in the bunker. He dug in the backyard. Army surplus, nor yeah, right. I, mean, I gave him that one because uh, in the comics, I just took it as an Easter egg for the comics because Frank uses claymores with that text displayed very frequently. Did, did uh, O'Connor? Yeah, that's true. I didn't think you about know? that. Maybe O'Connor somehow had it in his apartment, or house, basement, or something. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. if he was in the army right after Vietnam, a lot of stuff fell off of a lot of trucks right around then. And plus, if you're going to swap meets in places that, you know, you can get certain things that may not be completely dead. uh, Yeah. I mean, you know, he seemed to be O'Connor would I could see him at those kinds those kinds of uh, those kind of meetups. Yeah. And and the explanation that Frank has with Curtis, you remember what a Claymore does of how it works? You know, 700 ball bearings going speed of sound. That yeah. and you get an understanding of what's at stake here. I mean, granted, he's got a bomb strapped to his chest. That's not going to end well either way. But then that cranks it up just an extra notch, and you're like, oh, and they're going to die that way. Yeah, and not the sp- yeah, and not to speed up Frank and Lewis's conversation, but in a, in, a, in a sense, he's able to convince Lewis that he's not the bad guy, and in fact, he will work with him on some level. And Lewis comes down off his perch and eventually tells him it's the white wire, which leads into, you know, a scene that I really enjoyed a lot, which is I'm going to cut this thing. And, you know, Curtis and Frank have, you know, a not a lot of not a lot of dialogue. And well, I actually should say there's that moment where Frank kind of says this is because he, he's injured because of me. And for, and Curtis try, lets him off the hook and says it's not your fault, but there's you know this this brotherhood between them that you know at the very last second when he clips the wire, but they're you know heads together. I I just I found really emotionally stirring. Yeah, totally. When you have and that was how he figured out how to get to Lewis. Of look, we we're all in the same boat here. We've all been in the same spot. We uh, and and that was rather than than needling him and and calling him a coward and all that stuff. He comes back to look, man. You've got a guy with a bomb strapped to his chest who's been through just as much hell as you have, and he lost a leg in the process. And I'm the reason he lost it. So if you're gonna blow us up, what does that say about you and what you're trying to do when you're gonna take out two guys that we we are not your enemy? And we've been through the same shit you have, in some ways even more, but you can't see who we are any more than you can see anybody else in the world that is not your enemy. So it's time to put up or shut up, and he plays chicken with that Claymore, and Lewis blinks, and Frank gets him out of it. And, and I think that's the, they're, they're trying to make that the big dif- differentiator between Lewis and Frank, right? I mean, in, in Frank's mission, as violent as it is, he's capable of telling the 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 enemy from the innocent, you know, he goes back to that conversation he had about the soldiers on the base, you know, how, how do I deal with it when I'm dealing with somebody that's, that's just doing their job. And, you know, whereas Lewis has no problem just blowing up secretaries and mailroom people and and whoever he can get to, he didn't have that ability to differentiate. Yeah. 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 Actually, there's one scene I wanted to talk about and see what you guys thought if this was like, um, Get your opinion when um, I guess the final Billy and Madani scene, where Billy kind of allu- says like you know well, um, 
Sam got stabbed to death when he had a gun on the guy. And there's like that second where it's like his, his face kind of had an expression or that, that looked like, oh, did I kind of give myself away? And that they cut to Madani and it looked like she had that look on her face like, it, was it you? Like, did you guys get that kind of vibe? I, I caught the. Uh, I caught did the, she? Go ahead. Yeah. Did she say something to the effect of, "It's not like you were there." Yeah. 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 yeah I, I caught the statement, but I totally just you know I was expecting actually when she when he said it I was expecting her to have a reaction, and I guess they're playing it off as in her addled state of mind and her overwhelmed wow, overwhelmed state of mind that she just didn't get it. But yeah, that's the first thing I thought when he said that was, "Well, he just threw it right out there." Mm-hmm. Yep. And and then you go back even further to when she's talking with Raffi, and Raffi's trying to figure out what's going on with her, and she says flat out, you know, I told everybody the truth. Nobody wanted to hear it. So now Billy's saying the truth to her, and she misses it, and then you get the scene at the end with Madani and Micro over drinks when he's got the gun, and he's saying, look, I know the truth. And I'm willing to hear out that, that, and I know you know the truth. Now we, now that we are of similar mind, how do we get this done? Oh, by the way, if you want to get it done, you need Frank. And then you cue to the the TV screen, and everybody in New York now knows, hey, Frank's back as he's doing the Dukes of Hazard over the cop car hood. Yeah, that was awesome. Oh, I wasn't ready for that uh, at all. No, but I but did like the fact that he he didn't get away clean. That it was okay. No. Mm-hmm. He gets out of the house. He's out of the jam, at least as far as Curtis goes. But now he's got to move, and now everybody knows. And the fact that Ellison runs into Karen's office and goes, "Did you know?" And they turn the TV on, and you can even see Karen's face of, "Oh crap!" Yeah. The, the only thing I was, I, I was missing from that last scene when he walks back into the the hideout and they're showing it on the TV was the, the actual skull shirt. I mean, if he'd have had that on, that'd have been like the perfect scene because it's just totally set. Yeah. It, it, it was funny because somebody was saying to me, he's like, you know, like, wh- why is it that we're not seeing a lot of that? And I'm like, I'm really looking over that because it was burned up at the end of the, at, at, in the beginning of the series. Um, but it is really that, that point, Frank's back, the Punisher's back, and leading us from 10 to 13, what are we going to see? Is it, is it obviously, you know, it's, it's Frank's back and, and that it, everything the world now knows, which means he has to become, you know, what he kind of wasn't doing. Yeah, I'm interested to see the fallout of, of when Sarah sees that, because you know what, being all over the TV, she's going to see it. So... Oh boy, Pete's yeah, yeah, yeah. not who Pete is. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, because she didn't recognize him before, even though he looked exactly the same as when he was on trial all over the news. So now, yeah, she might finally figure it out. Oh boy. And if that's the case, how does that get reconciled? Mmm. Stay tuned. <laughs> did, 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 did Frank just put her into danger? I mean, that's or really I- kind of in her court, depending on how she reacts. Because if she doesn't react publicly, then she's situation for her is no different. True. Mm. Gents, uh, so let's just do a real quick round out at the, you know, we're, we're kind of landing the plan at this point. Um, some final thoughts. Uh, let's say, Eric, what do you got? Um, again, I've, I've just been impressed by this whole series that it just keeps going and it hasn't really had any of those issues with the other series. So, which is good that they're, I guess, getting their story flow together that they can start putting together 13 quality episodes in a row. Uh, I still love all the interactions with, you know, Frank and micro and all the, you know, secondary characters. And yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to see where these final four go. Jason, what you got? Uh, well, I'll echo pretty much exactly what he just said. Although I will say, I'm also interested to see um, how they play out towards the end as far as the big bad, because now I'm kind of getting, beginning to get the sense that is Billy going to end up overshadowing Rollins, you know, or is Rollins going to do something to amplify his status towards the end of the series? So I'm looking forward to seeing how it all goes. Ooh, what if Rollins gets whacked before the end? Yeah. Then you have to, then you have to uh, bring in the jigsaw factor. Right. Mm. Billy gets to step up. Yeah. Like a good mafioso family. Sean. Well, I'm just happy that uh, given the current, you know, 
climate in like our, our society that uh, I was afraid that this show would get buried before it got a chance to be watched. Totally and, agree. And the fact that it's getting season two means that at least it's doing okay, so. No! Oh, speaking of recent news, nice. Thank yes, you for bringing point. that in. Season two has been announced, so it is a real thing, and it's, this is not going to be um, put and slid under the covers and forgotten about. Uh, Devin, final thoughts? I really like these four episodes. I like the pacing of them. I like that there was not a whole lot of, of fat in terms of story on it. Everybody had a, a bit to play in it. Everybody got a chance to participate and have their stories fleshed out a little bit more. They were a bit more streamlined, but they're obviously going towards a central point in these last four episodes where we're probably going to see a lot of characters in a lot of dire straits. And then how is Frank going to get out of it? And and what are we going to see in terms of the Punisher when the Punisher finally really gets to work? He doesn't. This story is pretty much over after this. Damn it, man. I told you. No spoilers. Right. Season two All is right. just micro. There's nobody else. Yeah, that's right. It. Frank's dead. Frank's yeah, and, dead, and, and Frank baby. And Frank doing his Dr. Phil routine with, with some kids, that's all. It's that's the right. micro he, show. I'd watch that show, but I don't think it'd be as interesting. Uh, as this show is not as interesting without having you all on it. And uh, again, I firmly appreciate you all taking time out of your day to uh, joining me in putting in yet another Mark in the entry that is the Punisher War Journal. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks, folks. Thank you.